first. Um, okay, so thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm sure we'll get a few more as we trickle in past the hour, but uh, I'm really delighted to welcome you to this evening's guest lecture uh, by Salida Reynolds and really glad that you're all able to join us. So my name is uh, Evan Shea. I'm an assistant professor at UVA and we are hosting this mini lecture series as part of a special topic seminar this fall called Autonomous Vehicles Imagining Urban Futures, which examines the latent and transformative impact that AVs and mobility and transportation will have on the future uh, design of the urban form of our cities. This seminar is jointly offered between the schools of architecture and planning. And we're also joined digitally by attendees from the broader school at large to which it has been advertised. Uh, this is the second lecture of a three-part lecture. So last week we had uh, Robin Chase uh, speak to us and then we're very, very lucky to have Salida join us today. And uh, next week we will welcome um, Annalisa Maybloom. So a little bit about the format of this evening. We will have a lecture uh, by Salida followed by a lengthier question and a Q and A session. Following her lecture, I will moderate a few questions uh, and then open up the floor first to the students of the seminar and then to uh, all those, including those who are attending, attending digitally. So for those of you who are attending, attending digitally as well as the students, uh, please feel free to type your questions directly into the chat and I will moderate and call on you to ask that question or you can raise your hand and I will do the same. So now I'm delighted to introduce Salida and tell you a little bit about her background. Uh, before handing the reins to her. So Salida is the GM, the general manager of the LA Department of Transportation, uh, appointed uh, by the administration of Mayor uh, Eric Garcetti. She is responsible for implementing Great Streets for Los Angeles, which is a plan to reduce traffic fatal fatalities, double the number of people riding bikes, and expand access to integrated transportation choices for Angelinos and the region. She is also the founder and chair of the Open Mobility Foundation, the OMF, which is an open source software foundation that creates a governance structure around open source mobility tools. She has over 18 years of transportation experience throughout the US, as ha having advised transportation technology companies like WalkScore, contributed to the state of the practice, uh, state of the practice as an association of pedestrian and bicycle professionals board member. Uh, has mentored young professionals through women's transportation seminar and nurse, nurtured research uh, on transportation research board committees, as well as uh, serving as the president of the of NACTO, which is the National Association of City Transportation Officials for five years. So uh, I'll hand it over to Salida now. Uh, please join me in welcoming Salida uh, to give her talk tonight. Hey, um, thanks, Evan, and thanks to all of y'all for spending a little time uh, this evening. I know it's late -er over there, uh, but you know, I'm on the West Coast, best coast, so it's only three o'clock here. I've got plenty of daylight left, uh, plenty of time to get into trouble. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to talk to y'all because I think that um, the next generation of people who are coming out of um, architecture school, design school, transportation planning school, engineering school right now, or who are in the middle of sort of considering, um, you know, what they're going to do, what you're going to do with their with your careers and where you're going to head. I hope you have a chance to uh, make wildly different mistakes than we made. I hope that you uh, won't make the same mistakes that we make, and I hope that you will um, really be able to. Um, take a, a big leap forward in the way that we are thinking about and designing our cities, um, because we are, we are really facing some extremely uh, potent challenges. And transportation is really where things come home to roost. You know, if you care about public health, you should be in transportation. If you feel about, if you care about climate, you should be in transportation. If you care about racial equity, you should be in transportation. Um, if you care about safety, if you care about social cohesion, community happiness, um, if you care about dignified aging, if you care about, uh, you know, uh, uh, making sure we create a level playing field for people to thrive, transportation is this hidden thing um, that ends up being the key to unlock uh, all of those other outcomes. And I'm going to talk a lot about outcomes um, when, during, this, uh, during this presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and hopefully you can see it. 
Um, and I know Evan already gave you the, the, the history lesson, but as you're thinking about you know, disruptive technologies, uh, as a, I'm, a, I'm a history major, I actually don't have a, an advanced degree in urban planning or engineering, um, but what that means is that I'm always very curious about how we got where we, how we got to where we are, um, because I'm interested in understanding the lessons from that, uh, from the past. And this image is from Market Street in San Francisco, um, but it could have been taken really anywhere. It's around somewhere around the 1910s. Um, and you can see that, uh, you know, at that time, streets really moved at streetcar speed, which is about eight miles an hour. And public works departments were really consumed with keeping streets free of manure from all of the horses that still used the streets. You can see that people had unfettered freedom um, to step off the, the curb and cross and walk wherever they wanted to. But you can also see early signs of the last hugely disruptive technology to reshape American society, uh, which is the, the automobile. Um, and then, you know, it was called a, a horseless carriage. Um, so when we talk about driverless cars now, I think, you know, we'll, we'll hear, we'll, they, will, they will be called something different um, in the future. And it's up to us to figure out sort of what outcomes they deliver. Um, this was also a period uh, that, that predated the Great Depression. So, you know, around 1929, um, America experienced, you know, huge, an exposure of some huge uh, wealth gaps um, across across the United States and a huge economic shock. Um, and in the sort of post-Depression uh, period and really then following World War II, um, America got to work in trying to implement uh, the, the New Deal and then following that, um, the Eisenhower Freeway Program. So when we talk about Green New Deals uh, and we're talking and we're referring to these New Deals of the past and these big uh, visionary infrastructure projects, um, it's important to, to, to um, take a look at what those projects really delivered in American cities. So when you look at, um, this is a picture of, of LA, looking at that um, pointy building in the background there is LA City Hall. That was a period of time when it was the tallest building um, in the city. This is from the 1960s. So this is also the era when we dismantled our last cable car uh, line in, in the city of Los Angeles. Um, and you can see that we had really gone on a, a freeway building bench. And when you look at this, um, what you're seeing are uh, the city's fabric really being um, torn apart in ways that it has yet to recover from. The way that these freeways were designed and where they were built uh, was not by accident. Um, they were definitely designed to bring wealthier white homeowners into the job centers of downtown Los Angeles. And they specifically bulldozed black and brown communities and other communities uh, with ethnic minorities in them because those folks did not have access to power. They didn't have sovereignty. They didn't have, uh, they were not organized. Um, and in so doing, we walled these communities off from the ability to build generational wealth through home ownership um, and, and through being able to pass that on to future generations. And instead, we walled these communities in at Boyle Heights, which is a community just to the east of downtown LA, surrounded by five different freeways. Uh, and the number one reason that a kid in Boyle Heights misses school is because of childhood asthma. And when your child has uh, asthma and needs to go to the emergency room, because we haven't provided adequate uh, healthcare and you have to take two or three different buses to get there because we haven't provided adequate transit uh, service and then you have to spend all day and, and miss a day's wages. All of these things are legacy outcomes of the last infrastructure boom built around the last big disruptive technology. Because at the time, what cars represented were some core American values, independence, uh, freedom, economic mobility. And in fact, it remains true that if you don't have access to a car in most American cities, you don't have access to dignified economic mobility. This is what a hangover from a freeway building binge looks like. And as you consider sort of the, the role of autonomous vehicles and technology, I want you to ask yourself how this picture changes if every single one of these vehicles is electric and autonomous. It probably doesn't change much. And that's because technology on its own is not enough to change 
the outcomes that uh, that we see based on the way that we've built out our cities. Angelinos spend over 100 hours a year uh, stuck in traffic. That's Those are hours they're not spending with their families, in their communities. That's hours they're not spending uh, getting educational opportunities or being able to uh, move up in their careers and expand, uh, expand their own um, economic mobility. These are some of the other outcomes. Californians buy about half the electric vehicles uh, in the country, but we've seen a, a 5% increase in um, the, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, in California. Car crashes, number one cause of death for kids in LA County. Um, and that's a, a stat that is sadly true in most parts of this country. Um, but there are some things that you don't hear as much about. Uh, this is one of them. You can reach about 12 times as many uh, jobs in an hour by car as you can in an hour by transit. And in fact, if you don't own a car, have access to a car, it affects almost everything about your life, um, including uh, things like rates of recidivism. In other words, you are more likely to end up uh, back in the prison system if you don't have access to a car when you get out. So when you think about sort of the, the role of transportation, the role of technology, um, we really need to be having outcome-driven conversations because the answer can't be that everybody in Los Angeles gets a free car because one of our most precious resources in cities is space. We don't have enough room to move everybody by car. So how are we going to put the car and, and then the autonomous vehicle in its right role in the mobility system? Um, you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll sit in lectures or I'll hear presentations about autonomous vehicles, and most of the focus will be on the technology. It'll be images like this um, and conversations about sort of the, the edge cases that the LIDAR, the video is trying to solve for, um, but rarely do they show sort of, uh, you know, something like this um, and how an autonomous vehicle is going to solve for uh, is going to make better or make worse, um, you know, an American city, or in this case, uh, a Japanese city, um, you know, that is, that is teeming with people, um, where the edge cases that an autonomous vehicle technology has to solve for are pretty much endless. There's, they're not edge cases anymore. They're not a, a bug, they're a feature um, of urban life. So, um, so let's take a step back then. <laughs> what, what are we trying to do? With our mobility system and and what is the role of technology, um, you know the I think it's very clear that we've uh, invested a lot of time, effort, and energy in creating a lot of asphalt and a lot of concrete that benefit you if you have access to a vehicle. But we've left everybody else behind. So if you don't have access to credit um, or you don't have a, a steady job, you are locked out of our mobility system because we have designed it so inequitably. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, these were a lot of the images that uh, that we saw. People were sort of in awe of these open LA freeways that sort of normally look like this. Um, but there is uh, are, are inequities that are that are that are uh, visible in these images as well. Um, our data showed us that uh, fewer wealthier white lived on the west side of Los Angeles. Uh, working from home was a luxury for you. And your vehicle miles traveled plummeted. But if you lived in South LA or East LA, if you were a Black Angelino in particular uh, or a low income Angelino, your vehicle miles traveled increases, increased because as, as you lost your job in the service industry and the industries in LA that support tourism, you fell into a job uh, driving for a technology platform, something like um, Caviar, Postmates, uh, Amazon. Um, and so the, the sort of the, as we think about, you know, <laughs> how all of these things are interrelated, um, we're, we're thinking more about, rather than thinking about an individual mode, um, we're thinking about this new term that we've coined called universal basic mobility. So universal basic mobility is, you know, somewhat like universal basic income where, you know, everybody gets sort of a regular a check on a that, that is basically taking the place of a, of a social safety net on a monthly basis or a weekly basis. Universal basic mobility is this idea that the mobility system should deliver dividends to everybody, no matter what zip code they live in, no matter where they are. And what that means is that we have to start weaving together all of these different options. Transit can't do it alone. Biking can't do it alone. 
Driving can't do it alone. Um, and so we, it's, it's causing us to sort of shift and, and ask ourselves, how can we close that gap that I talked about between the, the number of jobs you can reach if you own a car and the number of jobs you can reach if you don't, while simultaneously disentangling auto access from auto ownership? Um, because I don't have to cover the ground that Robin covered with you uh, in her lecture, which, you know, where she pr probably um, illustrated that autonomous vehicles in an unfettered way only lead to sort of an increasing amount of traffic over time. Um, and the challenge for us as regulators and as people who manage the public right of way is to figure out what are the levers at our disposal? What are the investments that we can make um, to avoid that future, but to acknowledge that driving must have a role in people's lives and to knit together all of these different services um, to deliver different outcomes. So, you know, this is a, a traditional way of measuring streets. Um, this is the way we measure them now. It used to just be about how many cars can you move and how fast. Um, and then paradoxically, uh, how many crashes um, can you prevent? And those two things are really, um, they're really in conflict. Um, but now we are asking our transportation system, the streets and the services that we deliver on top of them to deliver multi-benefit outcomes. So looking at public health and safety, and by public health, I also mean mental health, um, looking at economic development, um, and looking at correcting historic racial inequities that our transportation system um, is responsible for. So, uh, you know, when it comes to street space, what that means is, you know, rethinking uh, the way that we use the curb. Um, do we want it to be for the storage of private vehicles or do we want it to be for other uses that can support uh, local businesses and a uh, uh, high quality of life? This conversation is nuanced um, because, you know, a, a business owner might see this picture and think, oh, that's gonna be great. I'm gonna have more seating for my customers. But a resident who lives in a neighborhood uh, in a rent controlled apartment might see this image and think, oh, my neighborhood's not for me anymore. So as we talk about economic development and what the street can deliver, we also have to be mindful of issues around displacement uh, and gentrification and how those things play a role, how our streets play a role um, in, in maybe delivering some unintended consequences. Um, when we've looked at these repurposing of public space in the, in the past, a lot of times from business owners I'll hear, you can't take away my parking space because I won't have any more customers. Um, and so we actually have studied it repeatedly in multiple cities um, and found that that's just not true. That when we repurpose streets for uh, human scale uses, they actually do support uh, local businesses and they can be um, really low cost tools to begin the process of economic, uh, um, economic revitalization specifically um, for, for parts of the city that have suffered from long disinvestment. So examples of that in Los Angeles, this is Broadway in downtown LA, just looking at this street, uh, you wouldn't know it, but it actually moves way more people by foot than it does by car. But you wouldn't, you, you know, the way we've allocated the space um, doesn't tell that story. So to repurpose it and change the way we use it, um, first we needed to win hearts and minds. We needed to convince people um, that there was a better and higher use of that space and so we threw a party. Um, we threw an open space party called Ciclovia. Um, there's something so powerful about seeing your city from the middle of the street behind handlebars. Um, the buildings, the architecture, the design, the whole neighborhood feels different and somehow magic um, because this is a space that we're not allowed to be in. We also, you know, we, we think a lot and talk a lot about partnerships and you know, it, cities like um, Jacksonville, Florida, and, and other cities are doing partnerships with, um, uh, you know, private companies, autonomous vehicle companies. Um, but what about partnerships with uh, community-based organizations? What about partnerships with artists um, that can change the way that people think about the street? So we had the city's poet laureate um, put some of his poetry up on an abandoned um, uh, marquee, uh, we had city artists create drop-down murals um, of the city's mothers and fathers. 
Um, and we repurposed a uh, major, uh, an entire lane of traffic on Broadway, um, which has been a, a, an incredibly powerful change to that street. So we took that template and we began to solicit ideas from community-based organizations around the city. This is Boyle Heights. Um, this was a, a Jewish neighborhood for a long time. Then it became a, a Latino neighborhood. Um, it has uh, one of the most fascinating uh, cemeteries in the city, uh, which was one of the only places you could be buried if you weren't white in Los Angeles. Um, Boyle Heights is this very rich neighborhood that is undergoing a lot of gentrification um, pressure. So we asked the community uh, to literally draw in the street um, how they would like to use their street differently. So, you know, they wanted to create murals actually and, and, and messages in the pavement. They wanted to invite um, their cultural standard bearers like mariachi bands um, into that street space that we had opened up by repurposing it. Um, and these projects were not expensive, um, but they were also not uncontroversial. Uh, this is Crenshaw and Florence, one of the most dangerous intersections in the city. Uh, we asked a, a group of community-based organizations to tell us how they would redesign the street. And they did use chalk to, to sort of repurpose street space and create these uh, crosswalks that look like scrambles. You can cross the street in any direction. But they also wanted to invite um, you know, music making and the festival of masks there on the right uh, to bless the intersection. Um, to create opportunities for kids to actually, that is a, um, a beat machine that is hooked up to the power source that's on the traffic signal pole. Um, and there was a piano player on the, other, on the other corner. And on the other corner, there was actually a, a bench where you could make music as well. Um, these kinds of partnerships and these kinds of street repurposing and this kind of technological innovation is delivering very different outcomes because the designers of these interventions come from the neighborhoods themselves um, and not necessarily from top down from government um, or sideways from, from private industry. This is a vision theater in Lamert Park uh, in South LA uh, where we the community wanted a place to gather. Um, so we took this street and we converted it into um, public space. These are West African art symbols that the community designed um, laid down on the pavement. And this space is always full. It is thriving. It always has something going on because there was a latent demand um, to use the space differently. So we decided to push that even further. Um, this idea of, uh, you know, our streets as part of a, a truly public space and a public asset. We looked around at neighborhoods in LA that were park poor where kids could not get access to green space and open space. Um, and we decided to close the streets and pull up what we call our box of play, which is literally a playground in a box um, with these modular wobbles that are designed uh, to be lightweight, to be able to be lifted up and moved around and stacked, flipped over, and you can put uh, an umbrella in it because shade is actually also an equity issue in Los Angeles, um, uh, to use the street in a different way. So I just want you, as you're thinking about disruptive technology and as you're thinking about um, you know, things that are uh, unique and different and unusual, um, you know, don't just think about bits and atoms, uh, but think about you know, other sort of wild ideas that can result in um, really meaningful uh, outcomes for neighborhoods. So uh, one of the, the uh, valuations for Play Streets, and um, we talked to um, an older couple who had been really instrumental. They had volunteered um, and helped us out a lot. And um, the woman in particular said that um, on the day of the Play Street, that the uh, gang members in the neighborhood took off their colors and rolled out basketball hoops and played with, uh, played with kids, played with other, other folks in the neighborhood. Um, and that for her, that was something that was, um, she didn't expect uh, that, that there was now sort of a, um, just changing the street really changed the story about who the neighborhood was for um, and why. Uh, and and that's, that's the kind of, of um, those are the kinds of interventions that we're really focused on. So autonomous vehicles, a lot of times um, people will talk about them as um, being able to deliver safety outcomes. And, and that's really compelling, uh, especially for somebody um, in a city where 
Uh, every year, about 250 people die on the streets that I manage and operate. About half of those are people biking and walking, the most vulnerable users of the street. So in 2015, LA launched our Vision Zero goal to get to zero traffic deaths by 2025. Um, and we set about trying to uh, focus on how we could solve for, frankly, vehicle design. Because um, if you look at the reports that have come from the National um, Highway uh, Traffic Safety Association, what you'll see is that one of the leading sort of causes of the increase in pedestrian deaths on America's roads is because the, the cars we buy are larger. Um, they, uh, it's really difficult to see out of, um, from behind the windshield, especially uh, shorter, smaller people walking like kids. Um, the cars accelerate much more quickly. They're, they're more powerful. Um, and they're designed to save your life if you're inside of them. But if you are outside of them and you get hit by an SUV, your chances of survival are much lower. And if you get hit by a car going um, under 20 miles an hour, uh, you have about an 85% an chance of walking away from that. But if you get hit by a car traveling over 30 miles an hour, your chances of walking away from that plummet um, down to about 10%. So as we're looking at streets, I have to figure out how can I slow them down? How can I create streets that protect people who are more vulnerable, people who are biking and walking? And what that means is I have to take a look at a, a wide street like this. This is Venice Boulevard. This was a formal, uh, former cable car line. Most wide streets are, uh, especially in, in, in big, big cities like LA. It's also a state route. And it's also on our high injury network, which is um, you know, about two thirds of our streets account for, uh, um, no, sorry, about 7% of our streets account for about two thirds of the severe and fatal crashes. Uh, we call it our high injury network. About half of it is in uh, low-income black and brown communities, um, and uh, unsurprisingly, and uh, Venice Boulevard is one of them. So we knew we'd have to take away a lane of traffic um, to try and slow the street down and also to try and create enough of a buffer between fast-moving cars and vulnerable, slower, smaller people walking. Um, and so we, we did a community build where we tested it out for a day. What would it look like? What would it feel like? Lots of happy faces. Everybody loved it. We did three years of outreach. We put in the project. We were so excited. People lost their minds. Um, they uh, really created a huge backlash uh, to not just what we were doing uh, on the west side of LA, um, but also uh, for Vision Zero as a whole. And almost every city that tries to have a paradigm shift in the way that we design our streets and who our streets are for um, experiences this kind of, um, of backlash. And uh, it really set the city back um, significantly. So we had to kind of go back to basics. And back to basics for us was how can we lift up and elevate and center um, the voices of the people who are experiencing the most negative outcomes and impacts of our current street design, namely kids um, and, uh, and, and folks in communities where um, there's just sort of intersectional tragedies happening on a daily basis and uh, traffic violence is one, of, one form of state-sponsored violence that they are experiencing. Um, so we partnered with uh, we partnered with school kids. We partnered with artists again. This is a pennant showing the number of people who have been injured or killed at this location, um, and it has that information down on the sidewalk below. Um, we worked with luchadores and Mexican wrestlers to try and get people's attention and bring it, their attention to this sort of public health crisis. Uh, we had middle schoolers design um, uh, uh, sort of awareness raising campaigns. Um, this is the 101 Slow Jam uh, over in historic Filipino town. Um, and uh, we also went back to we, we slowly but surely trying to redesign streets. This is around MacArthur Park over in uh, around Westlake. Uh, this is a before and after where we took that same template from Crenshaw and Florence with the cross, uh, the, uh, the um, scramble crossing, uh, and we put it in three consecutive intersections. Um, and we've seen the number of people injured and killed on foot in these intersections plummet by about 75%, um, just with some paint and some signal timing. Um, and then we, we got back to building projects, slowly but steadily, we did not give up. 
um, we came back to building projects. This is Avalon where we remove lanes of traffic um, and create more space for safe walking and biking. Um, this is downtown LA. This is uh, one of our first two-way bike lanes that we created. Um, and this is uh, actually something that we did during the pandemic, which is that we began to uh, really wall off um, formerly parking lanes to allow local businesses um, to use it, use that space when they could not invite uh, people to come indoors anymore. We took about 55% of the budget uh, for this program, it specifically invested it in BIPOC-owned businesses um, to try and uh, make sure that we could um, create better outcomes in the parts of the city that were that were suffering the most. And you know, thinking back about the backlash to the Mar Vista Road Diet uh, in 2016, and then thinking of looking at how excited people were to get rid of parking and give it over to businesses gives you a sense of just how far we, we've come. And I don't think we would have come this far if we had not stayed uh, persistent in our goals, even in the face of, of that adversity. Um, we've also expanded uh, our partnerships with private businesses, but under different kinds of terms. Um, this is Blue LA. This is our EV car sharing program, specifically focused in low-income neighborhoods. Uh, focused on use cases that benefit them. 55% um, of the, the users of this system are low or very low income. Uh, and so, you know, this is all about that same idea. How can we partner with private businesses? In this case, um, this is a, originally, it was a French company called Bolloré um, that's now uh, been bought by a, a U.S. company called Blink, um, trying to tease apart auto access and auto ownership. So car sharing is one business model, um, and Robin may have mentioned this, uh, that has been totally cannibalized by the rise of TNCs. So the rise of those artificially cheap rides that you get from Uber and Lyft uh, really knocked the nascent uh, American car sharing business model uh, way, way back. And the only way it's going to succeed is if government comes in and invests public dollars into it the same way we invest public dollars into public transit. So how can we take a more expansive view of public transit so that it incorporates things like EV car sharing to provide residents um, reliable, safe, and low cost access to vehicles, uh, things like bike sharing um, and, and actually converting those bikes to uh, electric bikes and making, making it so that you can use your transit card and tap onto the bike share station just like a transfer from one line to another as you are getting off the bus or getting off the subway um, and getting onto uh, an electric bike to take you the rest of the, the way that you're going. So, you know, we're trying to evolve these public private partnerships, trying to take a more expansive view of public transit, trying to really see ourselves as the activist investors who are trying to invest in um, business models that are being crushed. Um, by sort of the, um, the, the precursors to autonomous vehicles. So if you think about what Uber and Lyft really represent, um, they represent sort of cheap on-demand cars. And the autonomous vehicle future that some people are sort of thinking about are you know, centrally owned fleets of autonomous vehicles that have cut out the labor cost of having a driver in the car and provided even cheaper on-demand car trips. Um, so, you know, we know that that's coming, we know that it's happening, and we know that it's not just about autonomous vehicles, but it's also about um, urban air mobility, it's also about sidewalk delivery robots, it's also about all kinds of other um, uh, sort of private uh, mobility business models that are sort of arising. So um, we have to grapple with that. And in order to grapple with it properly, we have to think about and, and come to terms with a couple things. One is Starting in about 2010, uh, thanks to the ubiquitous availability of smartphones, um, we also have a, a business model shift. So in the palm of your hand, you know, you have probably, I don't know, count them up. Uh, I have maybe seven or eight um, different apps that can deliver goods or rides or cars or bikes or scooters um, at the touch of a button. And um, what that means is a tremendous amount of chaos on the streets 
And uh, me having to chase these companies around with interventions like road diets uh, to try and deal with the negative externalities. Um, you also have to deal with a, a hype cycle around autonomous vehicles. So, you know, around 2014 or 2015, uh, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't throw a, a stick at a, a transportation conference without hitting a panel on autonomous vehicles and how they were all going to be here in 2021. Um, but we've kind of reached the trough of disillusionment uh, with autonomous vehicles, and we're, we're having a little bit of a reality check um, that actually even these beginnings of um, autonomous vehicle systems that are being introduced um, by auto manufacturers absent real government oversight or regulation are not really solving for the safety or climate or equity problems um, that we know transportation needs to, to deal with. And if you haven't read Liza Dixon's amazing piece on autonomous washing um, and you hadn't heard that term before, I really encourage you to go check it out. Um, so uh, what do we do? Um, first, we have to create a framework, and you know these documents are the ones that LADOT uh, looked to and it has been using to sort of figure out what to do. One of the first things we did was to try and create this app called Go LA. We thought, oh, the thing we're going to do to get people to stop driving is to make it really easy for them to get access to all these different private operators, and we're going to, you know, we're going to be like um, uh, Sauron, and we're going to create the one app to rule them all. Um, and it's going to be great. And we're going to have this marketplace and we're going to, you know, regulate it. It's going to be awesome. Um, and very quickly, uh, we were disabused of that notion because number one, um, Uber and Lyft refused to participate, even though they're shown here initially, they, they said they would and then they didn't. And number two, in a city of, of 4 million people, we had about 2000 people download this app. Uh, and, you know, part of that was, was a, a failure of marketing perhaps, but part of it was also just, um, a reality check. Um, and so we went back to the drawing board and I started thinking about what do we do well? What, do, what does government do now? We manage and operate and steward the public right of way for the public good. Uh, every government in the world does a version of this, right? It's a stop sign and with a street sign. It tells you where you are in the world and it tells you as an individual human operating a vehicle what to do, stop. Now, not everybody does that. I mean, some people consider that more of a suggestion than a, than a regulatory requirement, but um, these are the things, uh, these are our current tools. They're, they're made of steel, they're made of concrete, they're made of aluminum. Um, but what does a digital transformation of those tools look like when instead of using um, the language of physical infrastructure, we begin to use uh, the language of digital infrastructure and things like APIs? So, you know, as I'm thinking about, I don't know if y'all remember the Pokemon Go craze um, where everybody was, you know, walking up, people were doing a lot more walking, which was great, but there was also a lot of tragic crashes that happened um, because there was no management of that multiverse. Um, it was almost exclusively like birthed, created and brought into life by a private company. Um, with no role for government to say, hey, you can't put one of those things in the middle of, of, of the 101. Like, that's not going to work. Um, so what does it look like if I begin to create uh, and express what the city's policies are in the, in the multiverse? Because right now, the way that we communicate with private companies is like this. Um, it's an email. Um, maybe it's even a map that goes along with this. Um, and instead, I'm digitally expressing my policy using APIs. So, you know, here's the plain English version, version of that same thing, which includes, you know, uh, elements of geography, elements of pricing, and then here's a digital version of that. As, as autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, other fleets of, of things that don't have humans in them, uh, show up in cities um, as a result of sort of subsequent business models, how am I going to communicate with those operators at scale uh, in order to, to sort of manage the, the public right of way? So we were thinking about all this stuff. Uh, we were thinking about drones and driverless cars, and these things showed up instead, really a lot of them. Um, and so we use it as a chance to test what we call MDS, the Mobility Data Specification, and accelerate that um, to try out that model. 
And, you know, this actually, this is now out of date. We've had um, in the, just the first year of operation, we had over 12 million trips um, and over 4 million um, API calls that we were taking and sharing back. Um, and this is just to give you a sense of scale with sort of big technology companies. Um, you know, this is something that, uh, that cities can actually do uh, for much less than what it costs to build out physical infrastructure. Um, and, you know, it, it really is powerful and meaningful. So this is just an example of um, the saturation that we were seeing on the west side of LA. All the scooter companies wanted to be there. Now imagine these are all autonomous vehicles or imagine they're drones or imagine they're sidewalk robots or whatever they are. Um, and the uh, community here it has a, a number of issues, one of which is there's a sensitive ecological use over here. There are some canals. Um, the other is they have really uh, constrained sidewalks and they don't have room to have a lot of these things on the sidewalk all at once. So here's the way we express the digital policy and then here's the outcome that we get. Um, being able to bring some order to chaos such that one of the things we measured is, can people still get scooters? Are we seeing a reduction in rides? And actually we were not. People were still able to access and ride, take as many rides, um, even though the companies were not literally getting like tons of free advertising by blanketing these public streets with their, their branded vehicles. Um, so the way that MDS actually works is that we get information from the company, never from the individual, never from the rider, uh, but from the company about um, what we call the state of their, uh, their fleet. So um, did they deploy something? Have they removed it? Has it been unlocked? Has it been relocked? Where is it in the world? Um, we get that information and then we push out information about where and, and sort of what our policies are. And those include things like, you aren't deploying enough of these uh, on West Adams per your agreement. You're deploying way too many of them over uh, on the Hollywood Walk of Fame instead. And as a result, we're either going to institute a fine or we're going to ask you to mitigate or correct that um, so that we're getting equitable service in a way that is um, that, that provides meaningful outcomes. So Evan mentioned the Open Mobility Foundation. Um, there are over 100 cities around the, the world that use MDS now. Um, and so we have to think about like, where can it go next? Um, so we're looking at, uh, you know, this is our sort of aspirational ecosystem. Um, this is me over on the left. These are all the things I wanna do with MDS. Um, and then over on the right are all of the, the company uses, all of the potential commercial applications um, and trying to build this out in a standards-based organization um, is really critical. And that standard-based organization uh, includes members of, of public and private entities um, that are trying to agree on like, basically what's the digital version of a stop sign gonna look like? And how is it going to be legible and used by, um, by companies? So. Um, this is what we're using it for today. This is sort of the next steps in our architectural roadmap. Um, you know, so really taking on goods movement, um, thinking back to the 84 games in LA about really the, the secret sauce of how we solve traffic was by managing goods movement in a more rational way. Um, and so we're looking at uh, what we call code the curb, which is using MDS um, to try and begin to both manage and price uh, our curbs where there's a lot of interest and pressure um, by multiple stakeholders to get access to them for pickup and drop off, for goods delivery, um, and all of those other things. And then we're looking ahead um, to um, urban air mobility, to um, driverless cars, um, and thinking about sort of, you know, these are all the steps uh, for all of the different stakeholders um, in the future when a, an uncrewed aircraft um, needs to take off and land and move either goods or people around the city. How is the city going to communicate the ground side reality um, of, of what's allowed and not allowed? Um, so these are the things that we're sort of working on now. And I wanna just close with um, a little bit of another reality check. So we just completed um, a study called Changing Lanes, where we looked at the transportation needs of women and girls in Los Angeles. And we went into three different neighborhoods. Um, they, they vary a little bit uh, in terms of their density and also their income level. And we did community-based research. So, so I know that sometimes when you are in an academic setting, it's very tempting 
um, to just focus on data you can quantify. But what we have been learning more and more is that um, bringing your whole self into the work, um, having permission to bring your own lived experience into the work, and then elevating the lived experience of um, the people you are trying to serve is a much more powerful or maybe equally powerful way um, to complement some of that more quantitative um, data work that and research that's been done in the past. So some of the things that we found are, you know, <laughs> something like a simple trip to the grocery store um, takes women much longer than men. And in fact, in communities like Sun Valley, which is largely uh, Latino, or Watts, uh, which is uh, largely Black, um, those gender differences are more difficult to overcome than they are in a place like Sawtell, which is medium income and uh, majority white. So there's an intersectionality to these issues um, that relate directly to transportation. Some of the more surprising findings are that there is a gender gap when it comes to a smartphone and there's a gender gap when it comes to a driver's license. So when I'm thinking about you know, deploying an EV car sharing program over in, uh, in Sun Valley or Watts, and I'm thinking about how many more opportunities women in those neighborhoods will be able to reach, I will fail if I don't also solve these gaps. And whose job is this uh, to address this? Is it the Department of Transportation's? Um, is it some other social services organization? I think we have to continue to push to expand and expand and expand what we expect and what we think the job is um, of departments of transportation or mobility. Um, just some uh, really telling quotes uh, out there about that we got that we heard back from folks. You know, there's uh, I know you you probably heard about food deserts and that this is something a lot of people are focused on solving and. Here in Watts, they finally got a new market and it's there and they've solved the place-based version side of that food deserts problem, but the transportation side of that food deserts problem still exists. Um, and and it, uh, there are pronounced um, issues around gender and race uh, that we have to really address and deal with. So, you know, the one of the more heartbreaking findings was um, the trips that people don't take, that women don't take. Um, because of transportation and a lack of access to uh, reliable and affordable transportation. And, and I want you to just look at the types of trips that women are not being able to take. You, you're, you live two miles from the beach, but you've never seen the ocean. Um, you're not getting to see your family members. You're not getting to tend to your well-being, um, which means you are not, you don't really have dignity and sovereignty as an individual. So as we you know, get caught up in some of these conversations about um, you know, technology and its role, um, I, I want us to continue to ask ourselves, does it deliver dignity? Does it deliver sovereignty? Does it deliver well-being? Because if it doesn't, um, then it doesn't belong in our cities because I want more grandmas on skateboards and uh, more families being able to spend time together um, and that's really, uh, you know, what we should be, the standard we should be holding every technology company to uh, when they come to the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Great. Wow. Thank you so much, Lita. What a super articulate, thorough, and wonderful narrative that you weave through the work that you're doing. Uh, I really, really appreciate also, you know, your, your focus and the, much of the discussion is really centered around people, but issues of equity, right, which is really central to every single decision we make, you know, as designers and planners and, and the idea that, you know, you know, race, gender, income, class, they all are interrelated into this, you know, into the decisions that, that and, and, and the idea that, you know, who do we design for and, and how do we design for uh, situations which might, you know, trying not to preclude certain things from happening, but also uh, designing enough flexibility so that the communities that they're there for actually have a voice and actually have are able to use them in the ways that they want to use them right and not from a kind of top-down perspective of the transportation planner or architect or designer who has a has a you know vision for what this might place might be which might be completely opposite to the community that you know it's there for right so I think a lot of the work that you you talked about really shows how giving voice to communities and, and 
giving you know putting power in their in their hands giving them the platform to to voice those uh those kind of concerns and they're also their their visions and I, and I really appreciate that i think that's a huge part of this this conversation i also really uh, really appreciate this idea of uh, kind of this transition now uh, of like public Asian agencies roles in from hard infrastructure to soft infrastructure and, and digital technology. And I think, uh, you know, LA, I mean, the work you're doing is like, in some ways, so cutting edge uh, in, in, I would say, in terms of a lot of public agencies kind of role in that or in that in that sector or in that kind of uh, thought process. So I think there's a lot of things to discuss there too. I think uh, I hope students will bring up some questions. Um, I do have a few, maybe a uh, few questions that I might start off to start start the conversation. So, one is um, you talked a little bit about uh, the line, like the the scooters that arrived and getting ahead of that and, and regulating that through uh, kind of uh, the soft kind of infrastructure. I, I, and you also touched a little bit about um, transit and. Uh, and I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to the role of uh, public sector agencies uh, role in transit management as it specifically relates to hard versus soft infrastructure, because, you know, part of the, the, the you know, part of the, the thing of getting, you know, less ownership in cars and also transition to mobility as a service is uh, providing alternatives to get around the city. And obviously this, you know, this is, Huge in the private sector, it's huge with you know car sharing and obviously TNCs and and last mile solutions like like Lyman and then then scooters. But the big maybe I would say elephant in the room is, is is transit and the role of transit in trying to to get people out of cars, right? And and certainly it's fascinating in the city in LA, which was obviously you know. Uh, designed, you know, uh, you know, obviously it initially designed around transit, which was the streetcar, but it was still transit actually that that caused the kind of the streetcar suburbs to emerge, right? So not that transit is the silver bullet to any of this, right? But but um, in terms of your your how you view the role of, of public agencies in transit. So in, in the U.S., um, you know, there's obviously this model of of oversight and management and 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 like in New York and in, in LA, right? There's this huge Measure M investment into the rail lines, right? And then a lot of the conversation is also uh, neglected in in actually what people the, the majority of people in LA use transit is through bus, right? And and I think that's also a huge opportunity where automation has the pot potential to affect, right? Where where suddenly if 80, you know over sixty percent of the the cost of of operation is driver. And the elimination of driver in in transit, right, in buses, does that mean that we can increase service? Does that mean we can increase frequency of lines, et cetera, et cetera? But then the the, the double side of that coin is, you know, the equity question is where do these jobs, like what these these minority populations who are often these bus drivers, for example, what what, what happens to them? But specifically, I want you to talk to, or I, I would like to hear your thoughts about how you see the role of public agencies in transit moving forward, right? Because there's a lot of, um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of cities around the world like Seoul or Curitiba where they're they're adopting private public mm -hmm. uh, uh, management models for transit, right? Where suddenly in Seoul, the buses are all owned by a bunch of different private companies, right? And so that encourages competition and, and better service, but it's all regulated by uh, the public sector, uh, but not managed by the public sector. So, and, and that that's kind of a more unique uh, or maybe a situation that doesn't exist in the U.S. And I and I wonder how you see the role of, public, of the public agency going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you. That's a good good. It's a great question, and I think it's one that's worth um, you know as you sort of walk through it, you think through it, it illuminates some of the same themes um, that that I mentioned. So. LADOT actually, so LADOT operates a transit system. And the reason why, um, this is why you always got to study your history, is that um, there were a whole bunch of routes that Metro, which is the county transportation agency and the major transit operator in the region, that Metro was going to um, uh, dis disband and abandon. And the city council of LA at the time um, heard a lot of pushback from residents that they didn't want to lose that transit service. And so the city stepped in and decided to prop up a transit service that at first was comprised of just these little neighborhood routes. 
but that over time grew to also include long haul commuter, what we call our commuter express service and um, paratransit service, which we deliver in a common through a combination of sort of traditional paratransit vehicles and also taxi vouchers um, for folks who maybe are don't need as much assistance um, as as uh, as as the paratransit vehicle provides. Um, and and but we had to do it in a way that was really cost effective because we weren't going to be able to create a new transit system out of you know whole cloth. And so we started out um, concessioning that service. So we actually have a model that is somewhat similar to some of the, the ones that you talked about, which is that we put out, we actually own the land, uh, we build the facilities and we create, for example, we're, we're transitioning our fleet over to electric. Um, so we you know, provide the charging infrastructure and, and um, the places where the, the buses need to be fixed and all those other things but we contract out the service to a service provider. The transit operators who work for those folks are covered under collective bargaining agreements, um, but we set the fares and uh, we set the, the service, sort of where it goes and how. And then obviously we also design the infrastructure. And during the pandemic, we've actually put in about 25 lane miles of um, transit only lanes, which is a huge increase uh, for us and, a, and a, big, um, a, a big move in the right direction. So I think that gives you sort of a sense of like if you are if you actually have a transit service that can um, also exist inside the agency that owns and operates the streets or manages and operates the streets, um, you have an you have a, a great sort of vertical uh, you know kind of consolidation of all of the things that you need in order to make transit work. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we made transit free. Uh, prior to the pandemic, it was free for students. We made it free for everybody. Um, during the pandemic, uh, and we've kept it that way, and I hope we can keep it that way um, indefinitely, because um, even though we had provided uh, uh, back about four or five years ago, we did a pilot um, for mobile ticketing so that people could use, you know, their debit cards, their smartphones to buy tickets to get on our buses. The majority of our riders were still using coins. The fare to, to ride LADOT Transit is 50 cents. Um, and what we heard back from people about why they use our buses, um, we heard things like, I'm a student and I get on the bus so that I can get access to free Wi-Fi so that I can do my homework. Um, or I ride the bus because, you know, it's got air conditioning, right? The bus is providing a lot broader service to folks than just an A to B sort of, um, sort of delivery of, of, of mobility. And the thing that I think is, is most interesting about um, countries where there is more of a private, uh, public-private partnership or even a fully privatized system uh, like the one in, in, uh, in Japan is that the way that those um, systems return value is not actually by charging a bunch of a really high and steep fares to make the money on the trip itself, it's mostly by unlocking the land value that transit service delivers. So building, you know, not just a transit station, but a whole sort of mixed use development on top of it is the way that um, those places are capturing the value of transit and returning it to their shareholders. Uh, and I think that that really has spurred some thinking on my part about um, the, the return on investment that transit delivers. So instead of talking about a cost per rider, how can we talk about a return per rider? And what I mean by that is a return of value that new transit service provides to, in, to an individual who can now use it. What opportunities does it open up? Um, you know, what new trips can they take that they couldn't take before? And how does that return of value to the individual? And how can we begin talking about public transit in that way? so that we can talk about it more expansively, that it's not just about the bus and it's not just about the A to B trip, but it's about all the other things that we wrap around it, including things like EV car sharing or um, electric bikes. Um, and, and so I think that if, you know, that's one of those provocations that universal basic mobility uh, creates is, you know, can we refocus on the value to the individual and figure out like what it, what do I, if I add up all the services, what do they equal in terms of um, an improvement to, to somebody's quality of life? So I think that's the that's my sort of long winded answer to your question. But the thing I'll say about um, transit and labor is this: 
So first of all, uh, earlier this week, I um, uh, spoke to a, one of the things LIDOT does is we, we give parking tickets, sorry. Uh, we also adjudicate those parking tickets, sorry again. Um, and we have parking enforcement traffic control officers that do that work. And we had a new class of, of recruits that were just getting started. And I was meeting all of them and talking to them about um, how excited we were to, for them to be starting a new part of their career with LADOT. And one of them was a transit operator from the Santa Monica bus system, which is called the Big Blue Bus, another municipal operator in LA County. And he said, um, I just can't handle, I can't handle the job anymore. It's become so stressful. Um, there's so much anxiety. And, um, and so literally, I mean, I, I was like, wait a second, you're telling me that writing parking tickets to LA drivers seems less stressful to you than what it feels like to be a transit operator right now. Um, and be, that's be, the reason for that is because transit operators are expected to do so much more than just operate the vehicle. They de-escalate conflict. Um, many of them are now trained to spot signs of sex trafficking on the bus. Um, they are there to help you if you're a little older or if you have a disability or if you are a mom with two kids and a bunch of packages. They're there to give you a break on your fare if you're a nickel short. Um, they're there to respond to medical emergencies. And nowadays they're there to enforce rules around things like mask requirements. And they're also there um, to be an extension of the social service system that manages um, people experiencing homelessness. Uh, in cities like Los Angeles. So we can make the bus drive itself, but does that mean that we won't still need a human on the bus um, to help with all of those other things? I remember I was giving a talk about autonomous vehicles in Beverly Hills several years ago, and I was talking about what it feels like to be a woman on transit alone late at night. And I was saying, you know, <laughs> women want a human on that vehicle, it, it's, they don't want Watson there like calling the cops and a guy in the audience raised his hand and said, oh, but we could fix that. <clears throat> Anytime we, the, car, the, the vehicle observes a, you know, an assault, the vehicle could just lock all of the doors on that bus until law enforcement arrives. <laughs> I was like, what are you? Beverly Hills, man, it's another world over there. <laughs> Um, not not part of the city of Los Angeles, I'll say. They, they're a separate city. But that just gives you a sense of like, who's thinking about the future? Who's designing the autonomous vehicles of the future? What bias are they projecting? You know, I like to say that like the hardware is neutral, but the software is biased. Um, and so as we think about, you know, things like transit, how can we make sure that women and people with disabilities and older adults and you know folks who come from all over LA are in the room informing the design of these vehicles and these services? That's great, Selena. Yeah, I have so many questions actually. In addition, but I, I'm gonna just in the interest of time, open it up to the to students uh, first. But I also want to just reiterate or or kind of summarize what you touched on, which is so vital and what we've been also talking through the, the class in the past few sessions was just this idea of working across disciplines and working across silos mm -hmm. and the idea that actually right to, to, totally to what you said like you know we think of transit agencies or, or transportation planners as only doing transportation and, and housing department as doing housing and and land use and planning is doing planning right but actually these are all intricately related and have intricate synergies between each other and need to be thought of that. You can't plan housing without knowing how people are, people, where people's jobs are, where people are going, how, you know, it's, you know, and the idea of like, you know, transit agencies and transportation agencies capitalizing, like, like you said, like, you know, Hong Kong, this is the model that they use too, right? They capitalize on the land generated because they know where they're going to put the stations in, right? And it's a, it's a value capture and it's also TOD and all that stuff, right? So, it's a it's a it's a perfect example of the need for cross disciplinary uh, thinking and actually holistic design of these multiple, you know, complex you know things that affect the future of our city and not just in the silos that perhaps the political system has set up very you know very much so in 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 certain countries the U.S. right the fact that we have a Secretary of Transportation and a Secretary of Housing, right? Maybe there should be something altogether, right? But, and this trickles down to, you know, all of agencies, but even 
in our role as designers to think about these systems holistically, right? Uh, but anyways, uh, I could talk all day about this, <laughs> as I'm sure you could uh, as well, Salida, but it, you brought up so many great points. I'm going to open up to the floor now. Uh, we have uh, anybody who has questions, feel free to type that in or raise your hand um, and I will moderate. So the first question we have here is from um, Patrick. Uh, Patrick, why don't you go ahead and ask your uh, question to Salida? Hi, I, I love the talk. There was a lot of great insight that you shared. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. My, my question is, thinking about a potential solution or not even a solution but maybe a potential idea about monopolizing if not the software also the hardware of these avs similarly to water or electricity mm -hmm. and maybe complete governmental control over billing and distribution of this sort of pr commodity of mobility and i was wondering what you if you had opinions on that if it might work if it might not yeah it's a super interesting question and um the the you know, when you think about those other utilities, whether it's water or electricity, you know, you pay for those resources as you use them. Uh, and it is uh, unfortunately, you know, starting to be less and less true, uh, particularly in, um, particularly in, in uh, parts of more rural parts of the United States, but you know, you're paying for those resources as you use them and you don't expect them to fail uh, you know, you don't expect to not be able to turn your lights on twice a day, right? Or to not be able to flush your toilet or uh, whatever the case may be. But, but transportation, which we don't pay for uh, on the basis of, of how we use it, um, our transportation system does fail twice a day uh, in most places, in the morning, in the evening, or at least pre-COVID. Uh, you know, there would be gridlock, utter gridlock um, during the AM peak and then gridlock again in the PM peak. Um, and that's because we have a tragedy of the commons. So we have a public resource with pretty much bottomless demand because as soon as people can afford a vehicle, they buy one because we our land use patterns have made that a necessity. Um, and there aren't as many examples of beginning to, to charge for that the way that you would uh, an other utilities. There are a few uh, global cities that are doing that, London, um, uh, Milan has a, a, um, a pricing program um, and uh, a city in Sweden that's his, the, the name is escaping me. Um, but those cities are seeing really interesting results as, the, as, as um, part of that shift. So when London first put in their congestion pricing ring, um, they saw that actually two things that were surprising. One is that um, crashes dropped about 40%. And the other was that um, small business people who rely on driving as part of their, their business, so think about a plumber or a gardener or landscaper or whatever, um, were able to more predictably book more clients because congestion levels became more predictable. So there are potentially good outcomes there, but there are also really fraught conversations about who can afford to pay uh, and what they can afford to pay um, and so we've been having the same conversation here in Los Angeles, not so much about monopolizing the, the, the autonomous vehicles, the software stack itself. That's a really interesting twist on that idea. Um, but how could we take, for example, the uh, revenue that would result from any kind of pricing uh, or treating transportation as a utility and invest it in more options for people and potentially even invest it in something that we're calling a mobility wallet? So if you are living uh, in a part of the city that's a transportation desert where we don't have great transit options for you or um, you know, so on and so forth, and you don't have access to credit or you don't have, you're unbanked, um, could we give you uh, access to a suite of transportation options, a bus pass, an EV car sharing pass, maybe some TNC credits, maybe some express lane credits um, to try and make sure that we don't exacerbate existing inequities. Great. Uh, I'm going to pass the mic to Lauren uh, for her question. Oh, I wanted to ask how would we approach giving AV opportunities to people who have disabilities, such as visual disabilities, so they really need a car, but they can't drive um, as it gets more popular? Because I know that some products and accommodations, when they be, are popular amongst the public, it's harder for a person with a disability to get access to that accommodation or that product. 
uh, and also drop off zones would probably really affect access for disabilities. Yeah, and you know that's a question that I you'll hear AV companies often talk about that as a one thing that they're trying to achieve. Well, this is a social good that autonomous vehicles are going to unlock, which is that people with disabilities who are often suffering from uh, isolation and um, other sort of outcomes of not having access to reliable mobility that works for them will now have access to sort of unfettered uh, mobility and they can go anywhere that they need to. But when you start to dig on okay, well then how are you designing your vehicle to serve those different populations? Because the disability population is not monolithic. Um, and when we see often these new mobility, um, you can see the track record of uh, private companies deploying mobility options in cities like scooters um, or uh, TNCs. Um, they don't, there's no, they don't, they don't invest in adaptive vehicles that can um, service people in wheelchairs, even just the simplest um, of, of sort of straightforward things that, that government requires of other companies like taxis, buses, transit, et cetera. Um, there are not adaptive scooters and adaptive bikes uh, that are available to people who um, you know, need to use those. And so I think it will require government intervention. And you know, when you think about the levels of government, the role of the federal government is really to regulate vehicles. Uh, the role of state government is to license who can operate those vehicles. And the role of local government is sort of to manage where those vehicles can go at what speeds and how often, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really a place where um, local governments have been advocating and putting pressure on the federal government to try and, and really bring some intellectual honesty to this discussion about what uh, autonomous vehicles are going to deliver, because at the moment, they are not being designed um, with, uh, for people with, with visual impairments. Um, and, and not just how can we design the vehicle for somebody with a visual impairment to use, but how can we design the vehicle um, to detect and behave safely around somebody with a visual impairment once they're out of the vehicle and navigating um, our streets. So I think it's a really good question. I don't have a great answer, um, but the, the, the pressure and the activism really needs to, to happen at the federal level. Yeah, and I think uh, the follow-up question to this actually, so Ramya is asking about digital literacy as a, mm -hmm. as a prerequisite for participation. Why, why don't you go ahead, Ramya, because I think that's a great follow-up question to this. Oh, hi. Um, my question is actually about the digital divide and considering digital literacy is the bare minimum for anybody to be able to participate fully in an autonomous vehicle future. I was just wondering if um, cities have already started working on this and if you could just talk to us about that. Yeah, it, absolutely. And um, one of the, you know, you saw that as, as one of the um, outcomes of the, the work that we did for the community-based research we did on gender equity is that that smartphone gap, which is, um, you know, part of, of digital literacy and digital access is that you know, if you are, you'll hear this um, term of art thrown around in this in transportation right now quite a bit called mobility as a service. Uh, and that's where that idea of sort of one app that's sort of an aggregator or trip planner that has all the different choices um, that you can that you can kind of get around in. And, and I guess the thing that I always struggle with uh, in that discussion is look, if I've got mobility as a service right now, you know, I'm an upper middle class white lady uh, living in a big city. I've got a tons of apps and access to all kinds of choices and options. Sure, would it, would it make my life easier if there was just one app? Maybe, um, but actually what, what about the folks who don't have access to a smartphone or don't have access to credit or don't have access to, um, or unbanked? Uh, and what are we going to do about that? And what that really requires us to do is to dig into some very complicated economic questions around the monopolization of payment platforms um, that a lot of, a lot of these uh, different actors in the ecosystem are using. And I think that requires intervention by the state uh, or potentially by the federal government um, to, to sort of um, 
lower that digital literacy barrier so that you know you can uh, so during the pandemic um, we created something called the angelino card uh, and that is a card that has uh, works like a credit card debit card it's got it's preloaded um, and we've you know distributed those to a lot of folks in the city who uh, who desperately needed it um, could we then build upon that by you know, using that same thing to be your ticket to, can you just use that to get on the bus? Can you just use that to um, access a, a, a scooter or a bike or, or um, an EV car sharing car? And what that means that we need to do is to make those systems so ubiquitous um, that you don't have to memorize where they are or have an app to tell you where they are. Uh, and we have to invest in the connective tissue in those communities, which is community-based organizations, faith-based or, faith, faith -based organizations um, that can help folks navigate all of those choices. So it's about the payment form and method, and it's about uh, mutual aid rather than digital aid um, as the, the bridge for folks to access all of those services. Because I just... It feels to me like, and government's really the only entity that's going to do that, right? That's going to invest in that way, and that's going to invest in community infrastructure, um, which is something we very intentionally started putting in our grant applications. Now, there's digital infrastructure, there's physical infrastructure, and there's community infrastructure. Those are the three legs of the stool in transportation, and we have totally neglected digital and community infrastructure. Um, and so, I think that's kind of the the way that we're approaching and thinking about it. But it is a really thorny. It's a it's a thorny problem. Great. Uh, I'm going to lump two questions here together in the interest of time. So Lily and then uh, Macy, you had a kind of follow up to Lily's question. So maybe Lily, you go first and then Macy, you can go after and then so later can get both at the same time. Yep. Yeah, so um, I thought it was really interesting when you're talking about um, the community involvement um, with the street redesign process. And so I was just under, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that process, like how it came to be, and then like how you got to the, the pictures that you showed us. Sure. So um, I've been sure. doing- I've been Sorry, in Salada, let me, sorry, let me have uh, Macy. Also. Yeah, let me get, because you get can it all answer in. both. Yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so I was also interested in that and wondering um, what you thought was the most successful like iteration of your street um, processing and if you've implemented it in other parts, other neighborhoods, other parts of the city and things like that. Great questions. Um, so I've been uh, in transportation since about 1998, 99. Um, and, and in that time I've watched, um, I, I spent a lot of my, my bias is that, I mean, you can tell by the, the way that I structured my talk is that how I got my start was in the bike parking program at the city of Oakland. Um, I was a history major and I didn't really, I just, I needed a damn job and I couldn't get a job in tech. And so I was a bike parking intern and I really fell in love with transportation, um, but I wasn't coming at it um, as somebody who was trained in planning or engineering. And so one of my first observations was just how miserable and broken the public outreach process was that government and, and it's not it's, it's just sort of happened over time that, um, you know, the state government or the federal government would put out grants um, cities would apply to get money to do things like build bike lanes, and then they would get that money and be very excited and then they would host a meeting on like a weeknight. Um, you know, in the in a in a very dismal, like small, dark, poorly lit room with like some sad cookies, um, you know, that that uh, community members would come to and the community members would say, hey, we've been trying to get somebody from the city to come to our neighborhood for the last 20 years. Here are all the things that we want. We want, you know, a new stop sign. We want some speed humps. We want some trees. We want this. Um, and the government person is there like, oh, I'm here to talk to you about a bike lane. And they're like, GTFO, like, we, what are you doing? We don't want to talk about a bike lane. Like, we don't need a, who's riding bikes, right? Bikes are seen as very, even now, I think, um, but definitely more so then, biking is seen as something that is um, outside of a social norm. 
Uh, most people get around by driving in the United States because we've socially engineered it that way, right? The way that the land use is, the way that we've subsidized cars and all of the rest of it. Um, but uh, so if you ride a bike, um, it's either because, I mean, people will tell me if, if I see somebody on a bike, I, I think it's because they have a DUI. Like they're not, you know, why would you be doing that otherwise? Um, and, and we wouldn't get any projects built and we'd have to give our grant money back. Um, and so when I came to the city of LA, I had been trying to change that process and really flip it on its head and instead invest in um, the time of the planners and engineers who work for me to be spending that time in community and then to actually say to community, we have this pot of money and we want you to tell us how you would like us to spend it. Um, and then, you know, that, that power and the importance of that community infrastructure becomes really obvious really quickly. And one of the things that surprised me about it is that um, typically in um, speed hump programs or traffic calming programs, which is another sort of program that many cities offer and they ask residents to say, where do you want your, your speed humps? The people who request those speed humps are typically uh, wealthier, um, wider uh, parts of the, the cities that are um, more homeowners, uh, fewer renters, et cetera, because those folks understand and have the leisure time to access power and to get things from the city. But, uh, and I was, I was a little worried that we would get the same outcome, but because of that upfront investment in trust building and community building, we got the opposite. Uh, the wealthier parts of town were like bike lanes. No, 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 we don't. No, thank you. Um, but many of the um, community groups from some of the neighborhoods that I showed you were really eager for change. And they, they, want, they were excited by the opportunity to bring money to their neighborhoods. Um, and we set out the, the parameters. You know, it had to be Vision Zero compliant. And it, 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 you know, we're not widening roads. We're, these are the kinds of things that we're doing. Um, and we got these suggestions that were so much better than anything we would have come up with. And now when I go out and write the grant to make those things permanent, um, I'm building on something that I know the community wants. And I'd say the most recent and successful version of that um, is on a, a really long strip, uh, a street called Avalon in South LA. Um, and that community-based outreach uh, was um, not just for transportation. So getting to this point about unsiloing transportation you know, at every community meeting, we had daycare. Um, they would exist for long periods of time. We would have food trucks. We brought in folks who could help people get rental assistance and get access to Section 8 vouchers and navigate that government system. We brought people who could help uh, folks do health screenings and get them access to health care, other things that the community needed. And while they were there, um, we got them to tell us how they wanted to redesign their street. Uh, and we did one of the longest road diets that we've ever done, where we took away a, a lane of traffic um, and uh, brought down and shrunk one of the most dangerous and fastest streets in the city, now has a, a bus islands and protected bike lanes, um, and it connects multiple parks along the way. Uh, Play Streets is my favorite program, just because, um, you know, come on, who doesn't love kids on, you know, running around in the street? It's awesome. Uh, but Avalon is probably one of the, the projects that I, I would, it would not be possible um, without that sort of long commitment to a different process that really um, is, is driven by community. The risk is when you do that, that you are giving up control of the outcome. And that is really scary for government. Um, it's really scary for government to do but the, the results are, are very, very, very worth it. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a great question and such a great response to it. And I, I think it's just really a testament to the investment and the trust and the, the truly the investment that you've put in with the community. Uh, and the, like, it's not just for lip service or for political gain or any, like, you know, anything. It's actually the, 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 the real impact that you believe that, uh, they they can make and should make you know in the design of our cities like I you know uh, this is obviously outside of the scope of our seminar but in the studio you know a few years back where we went to visit LA this was when I was at GST 
uh, you know, we went to visit so many community members, uh, organizations ourselves. And we mentioned the first thing we, you know, when we say, oh, you know, we're also meeting with Salida and they have just nothing but like, oh, I know Salida, like we're, you know, tell her this or tell her that, but you know, it's always That's nice, like, Evan. I didn't pay him <laughs> to say that. No, <laughs> no, but it's truly reflective of that, that the belief that, you know, LA, or, you know, that your agency is is invested in partnerships with the community, and it's not just community service or engagement for lip service or for 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 to check a box, right? And it's truly a partnership uh, for that uh, you know shared outcome. And 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 I think it's a, it's a great model for a lot of other agencies and in, in general, you know, architects and planners as we think of you know design and 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 you know we architects like to think we have the solution to everything, but you know, often we don't. And in many cases, it's better to listen before even being creative, right? So anyways, uh, in the yeah, interest of always, time- to, Always, yeah. whenever you feel yourself becoming defensive in your in your jobs, your future jobs or your, your work, always see that as a cue that what you really should be doing is getting curious and asking questions. Um, you know, when I, when I talk about the way community outreach used to happen, it still happens that way in a lot of places because there's this kind of zombie approaching government. It's like, well, this is the way we've always done it. So we're just gonna have this sad little meeting in the church basement with cookies and it's gonna be on weeknight. And you know, my, my poor planner is gonna get shelled uh, and, and destroyed uh, you know, emotionally and go home and feel miserable about that. That's how we're gonna do it. Um, and you know, what, instead of being defensive, um, about that process, then, you know, instead, can we be curious about exactly why it's not working? And can we listen, you know, and hearing from folks in community saying, I just don't want to leave my house because I don't feel safe. And when you ask them why you don't feel safe, it's about how fast and loud the, the street is and, and the cars, but it's also about a, a myriad of other things um, that, that as government we're responsible for and um, there are opportunities to change those outcomes. And you should, whatever you end up doing, feel so excited about whatever the problem is you're trying to solve that you do, you can overcome that feeling of defensiveness um, or, or boredom or procrastination and be inspired by a spirit of curiosity um, and driven by the, the something, that outcome that you feel most passionate about Whatever it is, I guarantee you can find it somewhere in transportation. Great. Um, so Cassie has two very different questions, which are both great. Uh, I'll let you read maybe both of them, I guess, Cassie, and then uh, so you can respond um, to either or both, yeah. Sure, um, hi. So uh, in our last lecture, I was asking and kind of questioning the theme of trust with humans and how to trust AVs. So um, I just am curious your uh, take on how do you adjust the human perception of changes in transportation technology and get people to trust AV, ditch the private car, choose a shared ride, et cetera. Um, and is it reliant upon making the driver's life harder, like as the headlines were kind of complaining? Um, or are there community outreach strategies that you use? Um, so that's like one train of thought. And then uh, kind of what Macy and Lily were talking about in terms of the street redevelopment. I'm curious if there's a model that could be applied to the freeway system um, as it's kind of dissected the city and uh, made it so hard for certain uh, minority uh, neighborhoods. Yeah, so, you know, behavior change is fascinating, and I wish we had more behavioral psychologists in transportation, you know, and, and anthropologists and sociologists and, you know, people who think about and care about, um, you know, our, our interaction and, and the kinds of things that really drive our choices um, that relate to the human condition, right? Because if we want something in a community to last, um, people have to love it. And for people to love it, usually that means it has to have some aspect of beauty to it. Um, and for people to be willing to take a risk uh, and to change their behavior, um, they really also have to be, um, they have to be at a moment in their lives where they're open to that. 
So there's some great research from Bob Schneider um, about that specifically. When are people most willing to make behavior changes? And um, it won't surprise you to know that it's when they're making a bunch of other changes, when they, uh, when they switch jobs or when they move houses, when they um, have kids, when their kids leave for college, when they retire, when they are sort of passing by other adult milestones um, of life changes. And I used to joke like, look, Bed Bath & Beyond seems to know whenever I move and they send me some coupons and tell me exactly where I can use them. Why are we doing that in transportation? That whenever somebody moves, we're serving them up like, hey, did you know you have all of these other options now in your new, the new place that you live? Um, and, and, and then this gets back to that community infrastructure piece. There have to be groups of folks who are already doing that thing that seems different and scary that are inviting new people in to try it with them. There's actually, and there's actually a pretty great article um, out that I read today by another great uh, um, researcher, Charles T. Brown, about uh, what Peloton, that the stationary bike company um, gets right, that traditional bike industry gets wrong about diversifying the number, the, the, the types of people who feel comfortable on a bike. Um, and digging into these questions of culture and marketing and um, and inclusivity that you know are really essential for behavior change. A lot of those things aren't aren't directly available to me, so I can I can you know find some pennies here and there to invest in marketing or or other types of um, uh, those those kinds of things. Um, but the thing that I have a lot of money for is infrastructure design and program delivery. Um, and one way to, to change that and to, um, what I'll say is how I like to describe congestion pricing is or decongestion pricing is um, making the consequences of people's choices transparent to them in a monetary way um, to create more revenue, to invest in that community infrastructure that enables people to make that shift while simultaneously bringing along the, the stick with the carrot um, is, is, is essential. Um, there's actually some great research um, by uh, Jerry Walters and reviewing and others about um, a whole menu of things that we put in place to try and change behavior and what their relative effectiveness is. So the relative effectiveness of giving everybody in a new apartment building a bus pass on, the, on mode shift is about 4%, right? It's very small. The, the effect on people's uh, mode shift, if you start charging them money for parking or providing less parking is 30%. And not only does that by itself result in a bigger mode shift, but it amplifies the, the effects of all the other things, right? It's, it's, it's not enough just to do it by itself. It makes all the other things that much more effective. Um, but you know, finally, none of that stuff works. Uh, I can give people all the free electric bikes in the world, but if there is no place to ride them uh, safely where they feel comfortable, they won't. Um, and this is a place where gender research really is important. Um, Jennifer Dill, Portland State University, did some great research about 10 years ago um, because the, the split, gender split of people on bikes in cities is about 75% dude uh, and 25% lady. Um, and that women specifically are willing to go further out of their way to ride on lower volume streets, <coughs> excuse me, that feel safer. So if we're going to give people the e-bike, we should also be charging them for parking and giving them a safe place to ride, um, you know, no matter uh, who they are or sort of, you know, serving all of those different types. So it really is a, a whole symphony of things that you kind of have to do um, all at the same time. And you have to time it right too. And uh, to Cassie's second question, um, this idea of, you know, being even more radical about how we change our right of ways uh, in terms of like bringing highways down, right? There's a whole oh, right. the freeway history question. of things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so like there's some great examples of um, freeway demolitions and there's actually money in the, um, the latest infrastructure bill. There's real money um, to, to fund cities and communities that want to take down freeways. Um, that is a, it's not a lot of money, 
but you got to start somewhere. Um, and that is a shift that started happening under Secretary Anthony Fox. I was dormant for a while um, under Elaine Chao, and now it's back again under Pete Buttigieg um, and his leadership of USDOT. So there's, there's now going to be funding for places to start um, studying and considering that. Um, where you've actually seen it happen is actually uh, Octavia Boulevard in San Francisco. Um, used to be the touchdown of the 101 freeway, used to go all the way into Hayes Valley. And after the Loma Prieta air earthquake um, that took down the Embarcadero freeway, uh, they also took an opportunity to sort of take down that part of the 101 freeway, um, which has now opened up um, this really amazing boulevard and has changed the entire nature of both Hayes Valley and also the Castro, uh, which used to exist in the shadow um, of the freeway. The other side of that, or the other direction that I, I don't think is gonna be as long-term successful is um, communities doing decking or undergrounding freeways. So the Alaskan Way Viaduct in Seattle um, is now gone. Uh, this was an elevated freeway that used to basically separate the entirety of downtown Seattle from um, Puget Sound. It's now gone, but instead of just taking it down and making it a boulevard, they've actually created a tunnel which cost billions of dollars and created all kinds of disruption um, for freeway traffic to still move uh, along that corridor. And, and I think that it'll be interesting to see, you know, the effects of that versus the effects of um, the Octavia Boulevard uh, project in San Francisco uh, across all of those indicators um, that I mentioned. In LA, uh, there's a, a two projects, the 101 Park and the Hollywood Park projects, which are projects that actually deck freeways and create urban parks on top of freeways. Um, and I think if the federal government opens up a meaningful revenue stream, um, that, that actually we might see more of that um, because the model, you're asking about the model, um, the reason why these things happen is really uh, years of community organizing. So the other freeway that came down in the 89 earthquake uh, in the Bay Area was um, the Cypress Freeway in, uh, in Oakland that went through West Oakland. Uh, and West Oakland had some of the highest rates of uh, childhood asthma and uh, certain forms of cancer um, in, in the Bay Area and the, the sort of persistent woman-led community organizing in the aftermath of the freeway coming down forced Caltrans, the state DOT, uh, to reconsider their plans to rebuild it and instead to repurpose those funds into the construction of Mandela Parkway, uh, which now connects to West Oakland BART. Um, so there are uh, a few examples around the country. There are examples of failed um, organizing to try and, and uh, do freeway takedowns. Um, there's a lot of those as well. And then there are also uh, really depressing examples of states like Kentucky and Texas um, doing freeway building, building new freeways or widening freeways, um, despite all the evidence uh, to the contrary that, that it will deliver um, good outcomes for them. But really, you know, it just comes back to the importance of advocacy and that community infrastructure um, and the way that government invests in that uh, as just as essential as, as other kinds of investments that we make. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, I guess I have so many other questions for Selena, but to be respectful of your time, I know it's actually in the middle of your workday as well. So we're 10 minutes over, so uh, I'll shoot you additional questions I have and I'll collect the additional questions that may arise uh, from my students. And if you have time, I would love to hear the answers. But anyways, I just wanna thank you so much for your time. Uh, I think it was such a fantastic lecture and really illuminating and actually really great to follow Robin's lecture uh, to give that kind of balance to her perspective. Uh, so I'll let you go now and I'll have the students stay on so we can discuss a little, right. little more. But uh, again, please, please all join me in, in thanking you, Salida and, and hope to keep you uh, abreast and uh, evolved in uh, the outcome of the studio and to get your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, my pleasure. Y'all get out there and do good work. <laughs> Thank you so much, Salida. Have Bye. a good one. Bye.